Hello and welcome everybody to Notes and Wires, where I'm talking to various guests who regularly respond to today's aspects of music technology in an attempt to map the current electronic music network. And today I'm going to chat with Nick Bat, musician, producer, synthesist, founder and editor-in-chief of Sonic State, host of your weekly Sonic Talk, one of the most trusted reviewers of newly released music gear, the fastest trade show reporter and synth meme icon number one. Hello, Nick. <laughs> How are you? Hello, Mark. How are you? I, I spared myself the PWM joke. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's usually the first one that gets uh, called upon, and I just now. Yeah. I, any the, the question is usually, does it have PWM? I just answer <laughs> yes to that every single time, rather than go. Yeah, you because know, I guess I should say. Oh, come on. Can't you come up with something better? That's been done now. Let's <laughs> it's have something a bit more creative. A but challenge yes, I appreciate for the, that, Michael. It's a challenge for the synth meme group. Um, all right. I'm going to start off with um, with your personal background. And um, yeah, we'll just start with what I came up with. So um, in a recent interview with the Music Tech magazine, Gold Fraps, Will Gregory mentioned that you are coming from the DJ culture. And uh, indeed, one of the projects you are most famous for, whether people actually know your name or not, was or is the Duo DNA that you formed together with Neil Stateford, with whom you produced the remix of Susan Vega's Tom's Diner, actually a song I believe that was written in the early 80s already. Yeah. And um, that has been a massive success and has been all over the radio in the 1990s. And as we're talking about music technology, there's even a significant twist here because this tune also happened to be the first tune used by Karl-Heinz Brandenburg to develop the MP3 compression format at the Fraunhofer Society, which eventually caused Vega to be called mother of the MP3. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, now apart from having been involved in various uh, remix projects um, throughout the 1990s, you've also been involved in the process of the production of a couple of Goldfrap albums. Um, their debut, Felt Mountain, Black Cherry, Supernature, and also their latest release, um, Silver Eye, where you've been credited twice, namely for the songs um, Anymore and Everything is Never Enough. Uh, you did some drum programming there, I believe. Uh, yeah, I've, I've probably been involved in all of the albums to a lesser or greater degrees. Felt Mountain was my first work with them, and they'd already done a lot of it, and I just kind of got involved and was a sort of, can you come up and help out? And then after that, I was sort of a bit more kind of integrated for the next two albums, following one a bit less and the following one a bit less again. Um uh, so yeah, and I did a bit on the new album that was, gosh, it feels like such a long time ago now, cause it was last summer that we actually, I did some work. It's just a week or so, just kind of, again, really just coming in and going, well, we're not sure if this is working. Can you just throw some ideas at it and see if you can come up with anything that might solve the problem of the arrangement or, you know, give it a bit more um, for whatever, you know, I mean, it's usually just a sort of sit in this room and and throw ideas at something and we'll tell you when we like it. <laughs> that, <that's laughs> and then when it comes it to the mix, we might not use any of it or whatever, right. but that's, you know, that is the, the nature of that kind of work really. Uh, I should also add, I'm not uh, DJ culture is probably not my thing. My partner was more the DJ. I was kind of more the tech kind of musician side okay. of things. So I've never been a DJ, not intentionally anyway. If, if I followed, um, Sonic talk closely enough, um, I think you've also been working as a front of house mixer and have been involved um, in uh, working at Peter Gabriel's Real World Studios, which are just around the corner where, of where you live in in, in Bath. Yeah. And, um, 
maybe before we um move on with anything that's current um I, I, if you could explain how it all started or uh, when you became involved in music or the aspects of music technology in the first place well uh i mean it started off like many people of my generation and you know it, it's the same old story you know they had an interest in synths got hold of a few things had a four track you know bedroom studio uh i eventually i started working with this rapper because uh, i had a sampler and he had he, he had some really good ideas and so he just came and sort of got me to put them all together mm -hmm. and get them to somehow work Obviously, this is before time stretch and stuff. So sometimes you just sort of go, no, that's not going to work just because technically it wasn't possible at the time. But he was a friend of Neil's and uh, Neil said, oh, I didn't know, you know, could, I've got some ideas. Do you, do you fancy getting together and, and seeing if any of them work? And that was the kind of beginning of uh, the kind of more commercial side of things. I mean, obviously, I've been doing live sound engineering and just kind of working on my own stuff and singing kind of rather... Uh, poor uh poor teenage ballads to girls <laughs> uh, that sort of thing you know but it started to get on track after that because the rapper's record was released we worked on me and neil worked on it together to take one of the key tracks into a sort of more commercial direction and it got released and then we worked on some other stuff and the first two things we worked on, on were tom's diner and a track called la serenissima which is a a kind of orchestral rondo veneziano piece from again from the 80s venice in peril i think mm -hmm. it was And we mixed those two, you know, it was hard work because I didn't really know, I, I didn't have many chops then, you know, I hadn't mixed in studios or that sort of things. It was really bedroom yeah. stuff. And so we went to a studio and finished those off. And then, you know, they got picked up and they became popular. So we started to have a name and then we started to get, uh, we got representation. It was all done very kind of ad hoc and that sort of, uh, uh amateurishly um so and then we ended up getting lots of remix work and we worked for a, a number of years probably three or four years just doing remixes for all sorts of people uh and then uh i kind of i've all i was always interested in synthesizers and technology i mean i think it started when i was very young there was uh, i think it was probably i really liked jean michel jar you know it's this great sound that i'd never heard before And I think there was a track by Depeche Mode, probably New Life. When I was a, a kid, I went on one of these kind of adventure holidays where um, your parents send you off to a holiday camp and you hang around with lots of kids. And, you know, there's a there's a sort of youth club aspect to it and you do all sorts of adventures and stuff. And and that's when I heard that track and it really kind of piqued my interest. And I just that's I guess that's Vince Clark days of uh, Depeche Mode. And that's really sort of picked me, got me very interested in synthesizers. Uh, although back then it was very, very hard to get hold of them because they were so expensive, at least to me. I mean, they were affordable, more affordable than they had been, but that was still a lot of money to me because I didn't come from a very, um, you know, wealthy family. So I kind of, uh, I think I hired a synth from a local music shop, which was a, probably a Korg micro preset. Mm -hmm. And that was the first one I had. And then I got together with a, a mate and we started playing in bat, uh, play, getting a band together and, and jamming. And that's kind of where it started. And where I, you know, until I wasn't really in bands at the time that I was doing that music with uh, the rapper and then got into Tom's Diner. But that was the very beginning. And what did attract you to synthesizers in particular? That's a really good question. I'm not sure, really. I mean, I, I think I've got a kind of I, I like pop music. I like melody. I like I like the kind of uh, the nature of those things. And I suppose, I mean, I'm really into all sorts of other music as well. It wasn't just that. I mean, I love guitar. I mean, I was into kind of King Crimson and Weather Report and all sorts and Frank Zappa and all sorts of kind of random stuff. And some of it was rock. Some of it was kind of, I guess, prog. I mean, so I think possibly because I know I could never really play like those kind of big musical greats. The simplicity of that synthes early synthesizer music, I mean, even Jean-Michel Jarre stuff was relatively simple. It was complexly produced, and certainly Depeche Mode was simple. And I just thought, actually, I understand this, and maybe I understand how you could make a song given those things. And all you, if all you really need is maybe a couple of great sounds and some drums, then you're sort of, you know, it's easier to get to what is considered to be a finished product. I, I, I mean, I, it's hard to remember all that time back up, but I think, I think that's possibly what it was that did it for me. It was accessibility. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I mean, in the 80s, um, which which would have been your, the decade, uh, your path to um, to 
where you actually ended up as a professional in in the music biz um that was mostly the time associated with uh where digital synth samplers and um the first i guess um uh computer production environments like i mean atari and that stuff sure well atari i mean this is where um as a german chap fellow you'll understand the uh the link there because it's interesting uh, atari was very big in germany as well it was like a kind of uh, uh in fact i remember buying my first hard drive from german distributor for uh, the atari but yeah i started up i started off on the atari i was a thought I, i bought a copy of steinberg pro 24 and an atari 1040 st and a four track and I believe my first synth that I used with that was probably something like a D110, which was multi-timbral. And I was very excited by that because it essentially gave me access to this kind of notion of MIDI multi-track. Mm-hmm. Whereas before, you know, I just maybe had a Mirage and I couldn't really do an awful lot with that. I had to I had to play guitar or sing or whatever it was to kind of flesh out the arrangement. Mm-hmm. But with the advent of multi-timbrality, that really opened the doors because then you just needed kind of essentially a mixer a multi-timbral unit and a, and a, um, a computer. And the, and the thing about the, um, the D110 and the, the M32 came out first or MT32, wasn't it? I forget which it was, but it didn't have the outputs, but I, I think that was probably the first really powerful multi-timbral affordable multi-timbral uh, thing that came out. And it was, it was, a, it, I don't like using the word game changer, but it really did make a vast difference to people like me in a bedroom because we could we could have eight parts and drum parts and we could create these kind of quite complex arrangements and sort of um, come up with stuff that sounded closer to maybe what we were hearing on records, right. although obviously not because it didn't have quite the same uh, rich tonal characteristics, <laughs> shall we say, of some of the other synthesizers at the time. So, but I guess one could say that you were a pretty early adapter to all this new technology that that arose in the 80s. I suppose. I mean, I think by the time it had got to being the Atari, I, yeah, maybe slightly. I mean, I think what happened to me was I went on, uh, I was unemployed, uh, as many of uh, my generation were in the UK at that time, in the, in the mid-80s, early mid-80s. And... Uh, I went on a government funded program, which was an idea. What they do is they, they, they ran this thing called a community program, which was, um, enabled you to go and learn mm-hmm. stuff. And there was a course in Bristol run by, uh, a, a chap called Steve Rizzo, I think is, and he had a studio there and he, it was all about the recording studio and he showed me or showed us the class, this kind of notion of being able to sequence and synchronize the tape. And that just kind of thought, yeah, that's, that's what I need to do, Mm -hmm. you know, because I, I don't necessarily need the tape at the moment, but I could make things happen with just a computer. And I suppose I I wouldn't say I was an early adopter. It was just, I was one of maybe I realized what I could do with it. And then I thought, actually there could be, I I started a business. In fact, as a sort of program, I thought I I could be the guy who operates that stuff. And I went to work in a local studio for the occasional session. I mean, it was awful. I really didn't know what I was doing. And and, and I apologize in the hindsight to perhaps some of the stuff I put people through (laughs) because they didn't know what it did anyway. So (laughs) I suppose I had the advantage there, but I I think at first I wasn't, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I helped them in some way, hopefully (laughs) at least to spend money in the studio. (laughs) Was that uh, basically the the reason why you ended up uh, um, in working in studios later on? I mean, in the nineties. Uh, I suppose, yeah, I suppose so because I was aware, I became familiar with that environment, and I understood, uh, you know, what what to do and what not to do to a degree. I mean, you know, I, I was still pretty inexperienced there, but I mean, it takes, you know, you have to kind of. A, do what you're told and B, not take the client down these kind of rabbit holes of uh, hours and hours of messing about. You know, you need to try and get them where they want to go quite quickly, which, as I said at the beginning, I don't think I was able to do that. But and also there was a whole other generation of musicians who were used to maybe playing synthesizers and playing live Mm. and playing in a traditional sense, like multi-tracking and the notion of sequencing and then being able to kind of work outside of their studio with their stuff and come in and then turn it into a more fully um, kind of finished record, I was able to kind of bridge that. So I would look after that side of things while they were thinking about the other stuff, which might have been the lyrics or vocals or whatever it may be. So, I I mean, it's like being a pilot of the the kit. So you look after 
one aspect of it so that the client could then focus on the creative side mm-hmm. of it. I mean, that was how it started out. And I started working with, uh, I was a band called the Corgis in Bath and I worked with them and a few other people, you know, and it's so, I was fortunate in that Bath had quite a disproportionately large music scene. You know, there were a few bands there that were quite, did did quite well as Tears for Fears mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff. So there was a bit of a scene yeah. going on. I mean, it's not the same as London or whatever, but there was enough for me to be able to kind of occasionally to, to get paid for some of the work I did as well so that helped me set up really that's kind of a a, like a still still maintained motive i guess uh you seeing yourself as more of a a facilitator um which is kind of what you're still doing in a different format now Uh, i guess uh, i mean i wasn't there wasn't an awful lot of room for me to be creative uh in that particular role but i mean that's essentially what i like mm-hmm. to do you know that's what i ended up you know certainly with later projects i had much more of an input and certainly with you know my own project i was able to be as creative as i like i suppose what it enabled me to do was learn the language of the process mm-hmm. you know so i could think i can do that i've seen this this is how you could do this or this is an idea i could apply or figure out a way to do things but i mean and i think this is the true with lots of people you know you have classically trained in whatever field you are whether it's music or technology or any of those things if you learn the perceived wisdom then you don't get to kind of because sometimes you might hear something and go oh i think i know how they did that and it's not the way they did it at all but your approximation of what you think it is that they Mm -hmm. did gives it something slightly unique and slightly different so i think that's quite important you know to to be able to just sort of play in that environment to come up with ways of doing things and coming up with sounds and coming up with things that you think I like the sound of that and that's where you get some innovation I'm not saying I'm a great innovator but I think generally speaking that's where the innovation tends to happen creatively yeah so I think it's a it's a common place for happy accidents if you if you want to recreate something yeah. and then you end up somewhere completely different uh, whether it's a sound or well yeah. either because you have yeah, yeah either because you have no <laughs> right. idea how they did it and you guess or because it takes you in a different direction either of those is perfectly valid but uh ending up at uh real world studios is quite a big deal though i mean uh, i'd be curious to know yeah, what you it, did it, there well, that... was it just in, were you just involved for a particular project or um yeah, uh, well, the thing was, is I'd been there a few times and I met people because we went uh, back in the day when we were doing remixes, you know, we have like an eight track or a 16 track and the the, the tapes that we would get would come on multi-tracks and we didn't have, you know, a, a digital multi-track or a two inch tape at that time. So we would go out there and transfer the stuff. So I got to know a few people and, uh, you know, so I was just a face in the scene i suppose and then what what it was i wasn't involved in the music so much it's pete gabriel uh studio was um he's re- always been really into art and so what he did is he did two cd roms he did a cd rom called eve and ovo and they were kind of quite cutting edge and also in the meantime and since the dna days i've become involved in production of cd roms uh with some kids projects and we did quite well with that and that was a separate company i was involved in so i had that kind of specific skill set so they asked me to come along and help them uh create the sounds program the sounds you know place the sounds put the stuff together because they put it all together in a prototype system that i was familiar with and then it would all go off and get coded so i just ended up working there uh, with a guy called uh richard evans who's another local, local engineer great guy he played with the peter gabriel band for a long time he still may actually go out live with them i'm not sure and um so you know we just used to sit out in one of the studios and just have really good fun but it was really different because you know when you work for yourself and a remixer time is very much you know of the essence and you kind of right we've got finished this there's another one coming here but there it was much more there was much more freedom to kind of relax i suppose (laughs) uh and and relax into it and it was great it was really i had a really good time there but that was my involvement there and i mean being involved you know it's a f- local facility so you know if i was working with golf or for instance we might go out there to record something or the band would re- would rehearse do production rehearsals there so i would be there involved in you know so i mean i have a i guess i just know the people there um but i wasn't working on specifically music stuff although quite often what would happen is there'd be a scene in this multimedia experience because it was each artist created their own mood effectively and they needed sounds and music to fit with that and so sometimes i would go and have a look in the store cupboard and see what was there and i remember pulling out a cs80 Mm. bringing (laughs) it into the room 
uh, well, uh, rather amazingly, it worked. And sticking it through a, an H3000 um, Harm- Ultra Harmonizer and just coming up with this little pad and everybody goes, oh, that's nice. And I remember Peter walked in and goes, oh, I haven't seen that for a while. And the next day it was gone. <laughs> you know, he'd obviously just go, yeah, I think I, I, I'm going to use that. You know, so it was very... Uh, Too bad. But it was great. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's his after all. Since you already brought up some uh, locations, um, I mean, Bath is only around 20 kilometers away from Bristol. An, another very important yeah, like music city in the UK, <clears throat> particularly known for being um, a melting pot for all kinds of genres like jazz, reggae, dub, uh, drum and bass, funk, uh, hip hop, DJ culture, um, uh, which sure. eventually led to the birth of uh, trip hop, the rise of bands like Massive Attack and Portishead. Um, so I guess your current location can't be underestimated uh, with regard to uh, the cultural backdrop that that was particularly prevalent throughout I the su- eight, in 1990s yeah i suppose so i mean when we were when dna kind of came to the force you know that the tom's diner thing was very much at the time in vo- in some way associated with the vibe of the uh, upcoming bristol sound mm-hmm. There was a, a remix duo called Smith and Mighty. They did Dub Good to Me, you know, that 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 and Red Stripe Records. That was where it was starting to happen. And it was ju- it was actually just before Massive Attack really kind of hit with uh, the first Blue Lines album um, that we were starting to kind of. I, I was I, I guess I was influenced by that scene. I love the kind of idea of it being heavy. You know, in my mind, Tom's Diner was an underground kind of you know type of sound. You know, but really, what it was was a pop record. Well, there's nothing so wrong about that. There is, there is definitely a kind of, no, no, absolutely not. But I suppose in my mind, I thought it was more credible. Yeah. You know, that's the th- first thing I learned in that way was, you know, actually, it doesn't really matter. You know, I mean, it was, it was, it was what it was, and th- and it was great, and it did really well, and all of those things. But it was very simple, and it was essentially drum and bass. You know, it was drums and yeah. bass and a little bit of keyboards, <laughs> but that was kind of it. But yeah, Bristol was really big, and that, and it's always been so. I mean, you know, when I was doing front of house sound in a local club, a lot of those musicians who went on to become parts of those bigger projects were coming through playing in bands. I mean, there was Adrian Utley and Will Gregory, obviously. I mean, I've known him for a long time. He used to share a studio. I mean, he's been a friend for years and years. So a lot of those people, you know, I, I know of or knew of and, and knew me. I mean, we weren't best of mates or anything, but, you know, we have a kind of, uh, we were all part of the same scene to a degree. Right. Are these, uh, well, I just call them local ties, uh, still um, still relevant? I mean, is it still that you, like, you go out to Bristol and see what's going on? Or, um... I don't so much. I mean, you know, I'm I'm a kind of family man now, so that kind of freedom of just going out clubbing and, you know, seeing that. And, I, you know, I'm too old for that sort of thing. I mean, uh, yes, to a degree, it was for a long time. I used to do work with lots of bands in Bristol. I mean, I, I started one of my first, gigs where before i got i used to do the front of house sound and i i ended up working for a band uh called davidge who's neil davidge was the singer and he ended up working with massive attack but before that i was working in his home studio helping him sort of realize and make his records and we ended up going to studios and kind of mixing that stuff he was a really big deal i mean they signed a massive deal his uh he's a uh, uh, when he was, a, you know, I guess he would have been in his early 20s. I mean, he's got an amazing voice. He's a really good singer. I mean, you'd never know that. I don't think he sings anymore, but now he's moved on and he ended up working with Massive Attack. I've known him for years and he worked on our record. You know, we co-wrote songs with Neil. Neil sang. If you want to hear Neil Davidge's voice, you should check out our uh, the, the one album that we made as DNA. He's actually singing on that. I think it was welcome. Yeah, but a little fact you might not know <laughs> about him. I'll check that out. Would you say that the the whole scene is still as relevant as as it has been in the past? Or I mean, I guess I'm I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. But you know, I'm not really that guy to evaluate it anymore. You know, it's my 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 moment and window of that kind of you know being that aware is probably you know waning a little bit. So yeah, I'm sure it is. And there's always been a lot of great music coming out of Bristol. And I think what happens though is you know you get I, I don't know if it's so much these days whether you get that because very much in the uh, late 80s and early 90s there was this notion of kind of musical hotspots 
everybody liked to think of it. I think the Beatles were probably guilty of starting that, you know, the, the Liverpool sound or the Mersey Beat sound or whatever. And then, you know, there was the Bristol sound and then there was the uh, Manchester sound. And then there was, you know, all these little kind of hotspots where people like, you know, and then the record companies who, frankly, you know, probably clueless most of the time just go, let's go there. There'll be others, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we can sign a load of acts and it'll all become right. a thing, you know, and that seems to have, that seems to have died down a bit, you know, that geographical kind of uh, hotspot type of vibe. I mean, I guess Berlin's got it to a degree, but that's still quite an underground thing. I mean, it's very fashionable. It's much more kind of, um, you know, it, it, it's more stylish, perhaps. It's more about style. Moving on a bit. I mean, after um, seemingly quitting the music business uh, after the 90s, um, you already uh, founded uh, Sonic State in in 95 i believe 94 mm -hmm. 95 yeah. and um eventually started your podcast series sonic talk for which most people know you today in um, 2006 yeah that's right we just turned <laughs> we just turned right. 500 <laughs> and um how did it come to that i mean was it like uh, oh let's just forget about the whole music biz and rather do something in its vicinity or um was it based on your own personal needs in the sense of uh, I wish I had something like that? No, not really. I mean, th I think the thing was um, it comes down to creative cycles. So a creative cycle for making a record, an album, say, is quite long. Mm. You know, it could be a year, it could be six months, it could be longer. So the input and then figuring out what happens afterwards is a very long creative can it can be quite a frustrating yeah. process cd roms exactly the same and you've got all these technical limitations the thing that excited me about the internet at the beginning of this was that i could just go hey i know that a little i mean you know back then it wasn't quite that simple it's a lot simpler now and then i've got something and there it is so the idea to start sonic state was to create a, a, a quick creative cycle so that you know we could have an idea put it online see if it worked you know Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I mean, I didn't stop doing music. I mean, I was working with Goldfrapp since 2000, and I can't remember when it was. I mean, it's it's 20 years I've been working mm -hmm. with them. Uh, I, I I stopped. I think from an artistic point of view, the idea of being in a band and having to go through all of that at the same time as the music business was sort of declining. It just doesn't really fill me with any interest. You know, it's a, it's a lot of work. I mean, it's probably more so now. I mean, I'm more interested in doing music now because it's easier. I can just go, here's a tune, stick it on Bandcamp, and, you know, maybe someone will buy it. Maybe they won't. It doesn't matter. But I don't have to kind of get a manager. I don't have to then make a record. I don't have to do all of that stuff that, you know, you used to have to do. Um, and so, yeah, so Sonic, is, it's evolved, though. I mean, it's turned from one thing, you know, it started out in text, and then it becomes uh, video in about 2000. And the podcast was really because I was starting to listen to a few podcasts. I thought, oh, that'd be good. I reckon we could do that. And and, and some of it to a degree is, uh, as is so often the case with me, because I enjoy a technical challenge. Mm -hmm. Is it, how can I, how could I do mm -hmm. that? Is it easy? And then this is how I think it's done, you know, which is why I end up with a system that works for me, but might not be a recognized kind of setup for everybody else. Uh, how did you decide whom, whom to invite? Uh, that was a good question, really. I just thought, all right, who do I know? <laughs> who do i know that i could ask and i started off with editors of uh a couple of magazines who are based in bath and a good friend of mine dave spears who works with G who company g4 software we when we since we first met we sort of hit it off and we, we're sort of friends and he's he's got a very dry wit and he was up for it as well and then you know various it just kind of expanded and then somebody would come along and go oh, i've got a mate who's you know and then they might end up being part of the pool of people that we mm -hmm. ask I mean, it's ever growing. It's. I mean, we had a new guest last week, which is Steve Hillier, who's a uh, probably most well known for his work with Dubstar, um, but you know, obviously done a lot since. But we have a quite similar background. His was maybe a couple of years yet later than mine, but we have a very similar route through the through that whole yeah. thing. So, yeah. Would you have ever guessed uh, that you make it past five hundred episodes? I suppose as it got closer, I thought it was. Part, it seemed like a long way away. I mean, you know, the, the thing is with when you do something like this it's quite a lot of work it's not necessarily loads to do it each time it's just when you think every single week there has to be this event happening and that that becomes something that you focus on and then you think how far in the future you know it, it waxes and wanes you know you have periods where you know you're maybe not feeling it you get a couple of weeks where you know you're not maybe on on yeah. it 
and you think, oh, well, you know, maybe it's time to think about, you know, doing something different. But it takes a life of its own. And that's the really encouraging thing. You know, what's been happening with it recently is it seems to have grown to a it's reaching a wider audience and it's encouraging. It keeps, you know, it keeps the energy going. You know, it's good fun. And we started to stream live. Uh, I forget. I was probably three, four, five years ago maybe four years ago and that helped because it, it creates the sense of event and we have live input from people who are around so you know and also the ability to do video properly has been really helpful with that as well it's actually i think one of the few podcasts that that makes sense to um be live because i mean if you look around most podcasts are rather watched uh, in the aftermath or something i mean sonic talk will yeah, be I too think it works but, both. Uh, there are i think it works both many but people. yeah i mean i if I had to script it and plan it, then it wouldn't happen. Now. Sure. I mean, it would be so much work. You know, imagine having to script an hour's yeah. show every week. I mean, crikey. Uh, with, you know, it, okay, if you've got a team of writers and producers and stuff like that, but it's very much a sort of, you know, I produce the show because I'm operating it here with, as we're talking, you know, this is the shot of me and it's all around. Mm. So, you know, it's it's done on a live basis. And it it keeps it fresh because you don't really know what's going to happen. Somebody might just come up with an outrageously uh, edgy story about something related to one of the topics, which is what I love yeah. about it. You know, some <laughs> been some great, great tales throughout the throughout the years and from the various great guests. Tales and rants. <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> and <laughs> everybody has their place. Uh, now, being someone who's been um, basically at the forefront of reviewing new um, new tech stuff that comes out. Um, how did the development of the recent years, uh, uh, by the way, when I say recent years, uh, I mean, I usually mean the last 10 to 15 years, uh, for the, uh, case of simplicity, let's just say the, the time frame of Sonic talk, um, how, mm -hmm. how did these changes uh, affect you or, uh, your own choices? And what in terms of instruments? In, terms, in terms of, of uh, general in, uh, instruments and uh, general music technology, I mean, obviously, when Sonic Talk started, I mean, um, there was no iPad yet. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I think I think what what we've seen happen. There's two things that have happened. We've had uh, innovations in terms of platforms such as iPad and online, and we've also had. As was starting to happen probably at the turn, you know, in the 90s, you know, we were starting to see surface mount technology, Alesis. Remember, mm -hmm. Alesis came up with, I can't remember the name of the mixer, and they started to use SMT stuff. Uh, and, and people were like, oh, my goodness. How did, and it's really, people forget how big a deal it was at the time because up until then, everything was kind of quite expensive mm -hmm. because it was built in a certain way. And then as the manufacturer base moved to China, I mean, it's all, always moving around depending on where right. the labor is cheaper. But as that became, because it's such a huge capacity that they've got there, and that path became more well trodden. You know, designers were able to to create these kind of really amazing uh, um, complexity instruments and and pieces of equipment and features that were and software as well has been in, enabling this. It means that they can do enormous amount more for the money. So it's been much more democratized. But at the same time. Um, at the same time that the music, the, the means to make music has become uh, more affordable and better and, you know, in many cases, you know, really quite inspiring. At the same time, the end product at the end when you've made your music has been declining. So it's a very strange, um, it's a very strange kind of uh, Venn diagram, I think, of what's been going on. But technology, I mean, it's a technology led, uh, led uh, industry to well, certainly the way that I look at it, but also at the same time, you know, you're still seeing instruments that use very classic early synthesizer design mm -hmm. and uh, in synthesizers specifically, this is something where I've talked about quite a lot is, you know, you see Roland re-releasing, you see, you know, Moog is continuing to push with their simple subtractive synthesis. I suppose, I suppose the thing is, is we all think we're really adventurous and really innovative and ready to adopt the latest technology. But when it comes down to it, we're not mm. because it's not, it's not familiar. And familiarity means ease of use and means instinctive use. Right. So for creativity, 
it's a different thing. You need to have a certain amount of familiarity because you need to be able to be quite fluent to begin with. You need to be able to operate it while you're being creative. Otherwise, it becomes like an IT operation yeah. or, you know, something that is not cre a creative process. So for all our kind of uh, desires for things to be different and better and uh, just, you know, can somebody just innovate? When true innovation comes along, we generally don't adopt it very quickly mm. because it's hard to use or unfamiliar. Right. Did uh, your own focus shift, though, uh, throughout um, the past few years? Yeah, oh, definitely. And I think that's down to a number of things. You know, when uh, I became a dad, so family uh, life tends to take up, it's down to time. You know, you get less mm. time. So you don't want to mess about. Right. And, I, and, I, and I remember I've spent 25 years, possibly more, sitting in front of computers making music and doing that kind of working that way. Admittedly, I didn't get the benefits of what computers can do now during that, but I sort of lost interest in being in this position the whole mm -hmm. time. You know, I like to have, I like to pick, grab something and just go, yeah, and, and, and be able to create something without having to think, oh, wait a minute, I need to get the, uh, where's the, yeah, what, what channel is that coming in on? How, uh, why is that audio not rooting to the right audio interface? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's still elements of that. I just, I suppose I, I'm less patient than I used to be. You know, I, I still like to figure out how how to do things, but usually what drives me is, is it going to save me money or is it going to be, uh, save me time? Right. And I think that's probably different. I think that's an age thing probably more than anything else. But I, I think generally also people are in front of computers so much, they quite like to be able to have some sort of visceral relationship with a piece of musical equipment or an instrument. Well, I, I don't think it's uh, an age thing necessarily because, I mean, also dozens of, uh, hundreds of uh, young, young people uh, moving towards, um, you know, modular stuff. And That's good. That makes me feel uh, less of an old every, kid. That's great. <laughs> everything. I'm, I'm in touch <laughs> with the kids. <laughs> <laughs> Just purely by accident, you know. There are now obviously dozens of topics we could uh, continue talking about with regard to current music technology. I mean, for example, Modal Electronics just uh, announced their Craft Rhythm, which, which... Yeah, we just got, we put a video up about it yeah. today, actually. They came over last week, yeah. Uh, which serves as one of the current examples for the interaction between so-called toys, I mean, not meant as a derogatory term uh, and uh, more sophisticated um, control devices like iPads as uh, Peter Curran just wrote about yesterday and um, the internet redefined the interaction between manufacturers and customers uh, I mean it's not really like in the like 20 30 years ago anymore um, and which also sort of shook up the release policy and the whole maintenance procedures of products. Mm. Um, we have an ever burgeoning Eurorack scene, although although sure. Andreas Schneider just uh, recently uh, uh, articulated that he uh, wants to remain cautious about that, as he uh, pointed out, it's, it's still a niche. You know, it's not like it's taking over the world yeah. and should not be overestimated. Well, it's, in, uh, it's interesting. You mentioned a point there about uh, how the interaction with the customer has changed the relationship. I, I would I would actually, um, I would challenge that. Yes, it does. It's the sort of thing that uh, if you're a, a multinational business owner, you can trend, you can judge the trend and what have you and, you know, customer support and customer feedback and, you, you know, you've got to be nice. But still... Most of the interesting stuff comes out of these mono visions of people who just go, I'm going to do that. And they're not thinking mm -hmm. because everybody on, you know, so and so forum has been asking for this. It's because I have a vision and, I, and what I that's the other thing about technology. The democratization of manufacture has also happened. So people can make stuff, certainly in software as well. They can make something that they've got in their head and go, hey, I had a really great idea or it's totally off the wall and they can make it. They don't have to convince somebody else first. Right. And I think that's also why we're seeing innovation, because you do not get innovation through focus groups. You, you, you get vanilla. Yeah. You, you, get, you get safety. You don't get, check this out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I didn't necessarily uh, mean uh, marketing tools or using the internet as a marketing tool. Uh, right. um, 
I was more thinking of the general relationship between customer and manufacturer in terms of, uh, I know, know if you are at least a medium or even still small size manufacturer, you may have your own uh, forum these days and, and you sure. get uh, immediate customer feedback. Uh, you may even set up your own uh, beta testing group. Um, and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. That makes it a lot easier. Yeah, for sure. And at the same time, it of course makes it harder for the manufacturer because requests are pouring in immediately. Uh, hey, couldn't you do this yeah. and that? And uh, why not? If I don't think. I, I also think there's a real uh, lack. I mean, it's changing, but there's bit, there's a lack of understanding of what goes into making something. I think there's just, oh, couldn't you have just put this in? And it's like, well, I could, <laughs> but bear in mind, it only, co you know, it, this component only costs a pound. But bear in mind that, you know, that pound is multiplied by five or six, at least by the time it gets to mm. you. <laughs> so, you know, those sort of mm. things, uh, not everybody has the ability for the, that economy of scale, you know, and I think economics is also a, a picture. I mean, you get people who make stuff just because they want right. to. And just because it's a labor of the Schmidt, you know, mm -hmm. ridiculous idea. I mean, it's ludicrous, isn't it, really? But that's what everybody loves. They just go, wow, I love that somebody did that. I could never afford it. I could aspire to getting one one day. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And he's not going to go, right, now I've made this big synth. I'm now doing a kind of, you know, affordable. He's just gone, no, I just wanted to do it. And that's the sort of thing that I really think helps push uh, innovation and just kind of keeps it full of character and uh, you know interesting stuff that brings up a, a, another question um because part of what what is currently going on um sort of provokes a question is is affordability already inventive enough and i'm of course uh, more or less hinting at, at what you also already hinted uh, the whole um retro discussion i think that that it comes down to the fact that people want familiarity they would like to own a piece of classic stuff that they can't afford so you know roland and to, uh, to many extents moog and dave smith instruments you know they're still innovating in ways but you know to the outside to the to perhaps the synth connoisseur you know it's like well what's different here it's just the same old same old and yeah you could argue that uh, but sticking to that and i'm referring to um Someone from your generation, actually, um, the the British music journalist and author uh, Simon Reynolds, uh, who coined the term retromania in 2011 uh, with his book uh, Retromania Pop Culture's Addiction to Its Own Past, um, mm. which is, I guess, something... Uh, Every every synthesis is quite familiar with by now. Um, so Reynolds um, has been around in the 1990s rave culture, which he perceived as the forward-looking, future-embracing period of his own musical biography. Just to wake up uh, with a really bad hangover in the noughties, uh, uh, in which uh, where which were supposed to be the future. <laughs> Uh, but instead, a um, set of years characterized by a fascination with and a production of anything retro, um, a cultural phenomenon that is pretty much overarching. Um, I mean, whether it's to musical genres or uh, as mm. of late, um, uh, synthesizers or... I mean, we already know that from the guitar business, right? Or the the fender reissue from the 1954 well they're, they're a bit like stuck aren't they really because a guitar is a guitar is a guitar whereas a synthesizer <laughs> i mean one could argue that perhaps a synthesizer is a synthesizer is a synthesizer as well it's just different sets of features i mean you don't get you know well you do get eight string guitars and what have you but you're, generally speaking the basic form factor is the same same with cars you know cars the basic form factor is the same because I don't want to buy a car and get it and go, I don't know how it works. It's got, I got to know how it works because otherwise I can't use it. You know, so there has to be a familiarity and it's interesting that, but it is interesting, isn't it? That, that the notion that the creative industry is essentially usually credited with the pushing of, uh, 
societal norms and values and stuff. Yeah, at the same time, is massively conservative with a small c to any change which makes it more difficult to be creative. So it's kind of like this weird di uh, dichotomy that doesn't really make sense. Right, and the synthesizer was originally like perceived as the instrument of the future. You know, like uh, not necessarily bound to any tradition or. Um not even to musical skills, particular one. I mean, like Daniel Miller called it the the best punk instrument in the beginning. Um, and now we've had Cork reissues, Moog reissues, uh, DSI did the Prophet 6 and the OB6, myriads of uh, 303, 808, and 909 clones. Um, a yeah. tendency that already started early in the noughties with uh, plug-in releases from uh, native instruments or Aturia. We have Behringer planning to clone just about any th synth um, that everyone could long for. And finally, Roland coining the slogan "Redefining the Future" by emulating synth classics in the in the Fast, in the yeah. boutique format. <laughs> my, and my favorite one is the digital circuit behavior. Exactly, that's, and, and that's a that's a cracker, isn't it? Isn't, that isn't yeah. that isn't that the point where it has reached absurdity? When you aim to digitally emulate sure, dig sure. vintage digital units. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, and particularly when that vintage digital unit, I mean, the D05, uh, I must admit, when I thought about it, I just thought, oh, God. But then I saw it, I thought, yeah, I would actually wouldn't mind playing. You know, it's there's something, they've got the, you know, the, the even though I've been going on about how small mm. they are, the D the D05 is different because it doesn't have loads of controls on it. It's actually quite small. But uh, by the same token, one of the first comments that was when we pushed that story out on just at the weekend, they said, well, I just bought an original D50 with a flight case for $200. <laughs> yeah. And this is $349. I mean, yes, it's different. It's got new features. It's got, you know, the, the, the processing is not quite so laggy as it was in the D50 where you're not kind of waiting for stuff to happen. You know, the sound probably is better it's got usb audio probably you know i mean there are things that you could get and access to those things i mean i think ultimately you've got to bear in mind also that retro is is fairly objective or subjective rather because i you know i'm i'm 52 this year I mean, I wasn't really thinking about synthesizers in the 60s when those moogs were out. So, I mean, it's not re it's retro, but, uh, but not in my lifetime so much. So for a lot of people, it's sort of seen as something new because they've not been able to experience those things. So I think there's quite a, a kind of complex psychological reason for this happening, as well as a purely economical kind of, well, people will buy it, it's familiar. You know, there's that. So, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of, I think I spoke about it on the last podcast. I'm sort of over the low pass filter, four pole low pass filter subtractive synthesis engine. I mean, I appreciate it when it's done well. Like the SEO2 has got a lovely sound to the thing, you know, but then as soon as you bring the resonance in, it's like, yeah, well, okay, that's gone. You know, that, that benefit feels like it's left. It feels like there's, there's always room for innovation. But as I say, you know, when you're thinking purely economic terms, you know, adding features and adding routing complexities means that it has to be designed properly it has to be bigger to accommodate those or it has to have some sort of sub menu system to kind of access them in a in a friendly kind right. of way so to design something well that works as an instrument i mean you know say the ob6 for instance that was you know a familiar thing i, ne I never got to play you know I, I reviewed that and it felt really good it felt like a lovely instrument it felt and it sounded very familiar because it made those sounds that I thought I could I could hear on mm -hmm. records. And that I think that's the thing. It's that familiarity is like it's comfort. Sure. And and I think in the same way, I mean that we could get onto a much bigger discussion about what where, what's happening to civilization. You know, I mean, I think we're entering this sort of weird phase where it's like the end of the Roman Empire where everybody became so decadent. You know, there's this huge amount of decadence. We're trivialized, you know, where things that really are really important are being pushed away in in uh, in preference for, you know, what how big's the celebrity pimple? You know, it's really and that isn't a, re a relevant thing or I'm worried about something that really isn't actually that important. And it's because we 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 we're, we're so, we have so much choice and so much, you know, there's lots of reasons for that. But I think in terms of just selling synthesizers, it makes a lovely sound that I like because I like that record. I can do that. So with all that was projected into electronic music and synthesizers, I mean, from the 50s, 60s onwards, um, is it's all now just ease and whiz, to quote Jarvis Cocker? Uh, no, because uh, it's much easier to innovate in software. 
and you get a lot of innovation in software. You've got all these interesting uh, iPad apps. You've got um, stuff like from people like Tim Exile. You've got these uh, applications that do things. You just think, wow, that's crazy. You know, that's mad stuff. And it's easier to do that because you've you've essentially, you know, you've got a norm within within the fact that you're interfacing with the computer. You know, you don't have to think about the hardware, way to solve that hardware. You map it via MIDI or whatever. I mean, ultimately, it still has to be easy to operate. So there's the challenge in the GUI side of things. But there are innovations happening in software. And as as DSP coders get more and more skilled and refined, I mean, we can emulate pretty well a lot of this vintage analog electronic what we can't emulate emulate in software is touching the stuff and having an instrument you can actually interact with physically and that's that's the you know so you, but you you talk to all these professional musicians you know you talk to some of the, the guys who started out with synthesizers and now they're composing for film they don't want to use that old stuff i mean they'll use it from time mm. to time but you know Hans zimmer right he writes five cues for one of these feature films and then the director goes, oh, I've changed it. Can you do this? He doesn't want to have to go back and recall all of those synthesizer sure. patches. He's going to be, you know, he's going to be using software because the workflow is more viable. It's like our, one of our regulars, Ty M1, he's got a massive collection of synthesizers and he does use them when mm. he can. But ultimately, if he's working, trying to do 20 cues of music a day and he might get a call the next day that it has to be changed, he can't use that stuff. It's just not viable. Do you still see um, um, a room for opportunity with um well let's say the ipad for example which i guess we've seen evolving into a real musical instrument over the past years i'm, I'm asking because uh, a couple of weeks ago there was a um, b-boy tech report podcast where they talked about that maybe future generations will just look at something like the push to and fit and say or an mp3 uh, mpc and say uh, what's that uh, because everybody's so used to um using their ipad or touch but, yeah maybe maybe uh, i i think i think the problem you have with a flat surface touchscreen with no haptic feedback is it's very hard to use instinctively because you can't just put your hand on it and know which fingers over what and just kind of go bang 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 you know it's not it's just not viable so you cut you don't have the same muscle memory i mean I'm, it's not impossible and i'm sure people will be able to do it but i think you know as we were talking earlier people actually are gravitating towards this hardware based thing that's why they're making this stuff and people can learn to perform using those things they can tr they can train themselves to be creative to, to shorten the distance between their heads and what comes out i mean the ultimate is you know what comes out of your mouth isn't it you know i'm improvising as i'm talking to you i have no idea mostly what i'm going to say it's sort of queuing up and yeah. coming out as I said, you know you've got some questions but generally in conversation one is not you know one is not planning what is what what's what, what's going to say but if you had to kind of if you had to know where each, how long each word was going to be, or there was some technical limitation to the way that your words would would be formed, it would limit the ability to be fluent. And that's the and, and the iPad is great. I think the iPad, where the iPad's going to happen, is it's going to more. I think it's going to become because there's some really great instruments coming out for iPad that just sound fantastic. And you just think, well, actually, if I had a physical interface, I'd just use it like a computer. It's or a laptop. It just becomes the DSP effectively for whatever it is. And, and I can touch it to, you know, maybe it's got an XY pad or something that's, I just have to sort of w wave in roughly the right direction. But if I've got to kind of find a tiny little knob and do this with my finger, I have to look at it really close. If I'm playing live, I don't want, I want to be just kind of going playing and I'm, I'm reaching because I know where the knob is and I turn it and I'm still having my physical contact with either the, the, the audience or whatever else it is that I might be thinking about if I'm recording, for instance, you know, and I think, that's where there's there's the problem with the iPad being the kind of be all and end all. I think that the uh, it doesn't do everything. I mean, it can, but it doesn't replace that notion of being able to learn a layout of something and be able to kind of reach for it. I think there's another aspect to it as well. I mean, I think you know, in the, you go right back to the beginning. You know, your favorite band in the '60s. You recognize them. They would dress a certain way they would play a certain instrument and that would be their vibe and i think once you if you if you homogenize everything into it all goes on an ipad or it's all on a laptop it's harder to be recognizably different 
You know, there has to be, you know, it, it's yet another thing that's the same as everybody else. I'm not saying that, you know, musically you can't be different, but there's there's too much similarity between all the different factions and the styles of music. And it becomes quite difficult to differentiate. You know, I mean, we know Dead Mouse because he wears a bloody great mouse head. You know, I mean, that's what I know. recognize him. I mean, for whatever else he does, he's just, you know, superstar DJ producer, mm-hmm. but that's his USP. Right. You know? So there are... And I think sometimes, you know, if, if I went to see a band the other day, uh, actually, and the guy was playing two Tenorions. Mm-hmm. Remember yeah. those? Yeah. Yamaha. And I just thought, oh, my God, you know, that really stuck in my head because that is just so out there and so different. Mm-hmm. And I think to a degree, what you're doing by using things that are different and unique is almost reinforcing the sense that you have this unique creative ability. You know, when you look at that, how does he do it or she do it with that stuff? I, I didn't realize you could do it with that stuff. Whereas someone turns up with a laptop and iPad, it's like, oh yeah, you know, I've seen yeah. something a bit like that already. You know, there's not, you know, I mean, there are still plenty of innovation going on, but j- j- the base level of sort of, yeah, you can do that with et cetera, you know, is sort of pretty much the same. And then, so you don't get so much of a diversity so easily and that, that's not necessarily and that might be more for the from the audience's point of view you know because you can have four people with laptops that do fan, or ipads that do fantastic brilliantly musically relevant stuff but from an audience point of view it's like they look at them and they go i can't how can i differentiate between those people so so you say um most most of the innovation is is going to take place um from now on in in software and the development of controllers i think that you might emulate stuff in software in 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 electronics but i mean analog electronics will do what analog electronics does i mean i think you know you can see it in the eurac market where some of the really interesting stuff is essentially digital control of analog signals mm-hmm. you know it's it's the thing it's it's doing really interesting ways of manipulating it and changing it up things that are hard to do And, you know, someone will realize something in software, in hardware, if it's just got this, it's missing the performance aspect, but everybody loves the sound. It's like, well, I'll make something that, that controls that, you know, because I mean, most synths that aren't just pure analog electronics are essentially controllers for a little microcomputer inside it that's doing all the work. Is is there anything from the current Eurorack scene you would like to see on a larger scale? I'm not really big on Eurorack stuff. I mean... I'm now getting to the age where I understand why people like five U things because it's it's big and you can see your way around it easier. It's just easier to operate. I think the big challenge for Eurorack is, you know, the problem becomes the more complex a patch you make on Eurorack, the harder it is to see what's going on and know what to do because the the patching itself obscures the interface. So you end up with this uh, this kind of curious scenario, whereas the you know uh, it becomes impenetrable, and that in a way has its charm because it's like wow, I don't understand this at all, but it sounds great, you know, which is. Because it also has to do with a sh- but, but shift of um, uh, focus from more to to, to um, finish product to process alone. I think I see it quite a lot because we interview quite a lot of performers at various shows, and. Um, One of the things that they ask about and they, they're looking for is a, a, a mixing solution that they can continue to use within the Eurorack mm-hmm. format. And again, that's difficult because you need an interface for a mixer. And as soon as you plug a load of stuff into it, you can't see the interface. Right. You know, it's that sort of same argument. But the point is about Eurorack is, you know, people who make it with that, it's it's different every time. You know, and it's like, I've made this patch. I'm going to gig it. You know, that's great. And I like that. I like the fact that it, this non-repeat, this uh, ephemeral nature of it is is what's what's appealing to lots of people we we did something at Cymru Beats uh in the summer and everybody just had no idea what they were going to do pretty much they hadn't planned it they you know roughly planned a few things but they didn't know how it was going to turn out and that and that's kind of risky you know especially in front of an audience but it's exciting and that's I guess why people respond to it you're very well acquainted with anything meaty I mean you're not only Uh, using it in the casual way but uh, it is my understanding that you also use it to control your podcasts uh, yeah. and is is there anything um i mean this has been discussed over years um is there anything you would wish to see in midi it's interesting i think i think there needs to be an extension of the specification there needs to be a simpler simpler a way to simplify kind of 
figuring out what's what and you know this nrpn business is a nightmare to program and map controllers too it's just not much fun so i guess we just need higher resolution so that becomes easier i i will say though the more i use midi i mean i use midi all over the place it's absolutely brilliant as just a kind of communication bus to do stuff it's like i press this button something happens on a computer over there you know we use it for i use it for running the podcast i use it for running the studio behind me where we're switching cameras and camera angles I use it, uh, you know, everywhere, everywhere I can, because I understand it's easy. And you've got 16 channels of kind of, you know, you've got 128 switches plus all those controllers mm. per mm. channel. So you could do so much stuff with mm. it. I mean, I think it's a it, it's it's still I think it's still hugely underutilized as a communication um, route. So, yeah, I, I, I don't but I don't know. What would I like to see? I mean, I think people people would what what you want is a, is a faster bus and a higher resolution set of controllers because obviously for for fades and for high resolution parameters that's that would be good but i don't see that as necessarily being terribly difficult i think it's it, it's it's been utilized in some instruments but it's uh not like most daws do actually support it well it's got to be standardized doesn't it i mean the standard is fixed and then we haven't come up with another i mean that's one of those kind of bizarre accidents of uh spirit of cooperation that resulted in something really good i mean the reason it's done so well and the reason nothing else has happened is because that is such a rare rare scenario i mean think of two instances right midi and urac any others adat maybe maybe adat usb possibly that's it there aren't you know and and those And the, but the USB is a much higher level transport. You're still piping MIDI down it. Sure. So, so ultimately, you know, the actual, you know, there's very few kind of instances I can think of where that level of kind of adoption, because everybody wants to own the standard, don't they? Because they think, oh, I could get licensing off it. You know, I mean, it's economics. So leaving off with uh, where you um, where you were heading towards with Sonic State, <laughs> the internet. <laughs> Now, um, oh yeah, that yeah. <laughs> Holger Shukai, the legendary can bassist and mastermind of, I would say, mastermind of digital means of music production, who sadly left us last week. Uh, he would always say that uh, the internet provided a platform um, for people like him, um, who would do this collage work, not only. Um, in terms of musical content but also in terms of collaboration um how would you how would you rate the influence of the internet um i mean with regard to online communities file and mix sharing platforms and the possibilities thereof in terms of possible collaborations or, or further mm. potentials well i th i think i think what we've seen is the you know exploited more the, the the biggest part of that equation that's been you know most successful is the digital di means of digital distribution you know i can make a tune i can put it on bandcamp i can promote it yeah i've got a platform which has enabled me to reach perhaps more people than you know if i wasn't me but it means i can put something out and it can be sold you know you can actually create if you're making something that people want you could you could make a reasonable living if you're any good and you've got a bit of now on how to promote yourself collaboratively obviously it enables more communication so people were bound to be meeting up more and thinking about collaborations but i don't think the actual internet as a transport method for collaboration in real time is there you know we've seen people try and do it you know there's been there was first there was rocket networks which is years ago then there's uh, the steinberg stuff uh, vst connect you know there's None of it is quite there, but I don't know whether that's purely because people don't feel ready or it's complicated to set up or the fact that it's just not quite fast enough. I mean, you know, we do a show every week, which is a live broadcast. We're talking remotely now via video. For us, it's great. But if I call somebody and their internet's no good, it's sort of, well, that's that right. then. You know, there's no, there's no guarantee, is there, that it's going to work. And collaborations, particularly when you're being creative, you sort of, don't want to shoot your best bit and then have it got ruined it's a bit like you know you go into the studio and the tape op or the you know the engineer goes i'm sorry i forgot to press record i mean 
you can multiply that by a significant factor in terms of real time online collaboration as being a potential pratfall. And that's, you know, that's what means it's not been perhaps, uh, it's not there yet, but I, I undoubtedly it will be. Could you, for example, imagine integrating your audience further? Oh, undoubtedly. Yeah. I mean, we do, uh, we could, uh, the difficulty for me at the moment is I can't do that and be the host at the same time there's only so much i can do as a single person and as soon as you get another person involved then it's you know that person that and has to give up their time to do that whatever it may be and we have to have a way of saying oh yeah this is coming but yeah of course i mean you know i i haven't really applied my imagination to the notion of that i mean the last thing i did do is figure out how to bring in the youtube chat stream into the kind of video mm -hmm. window so at least we can see what they're yeah. saying and i can try and involve people in the conversation but yeah undoubtedly there's going to be lots of interactive uh, uh ways of doing things you know there might be some something which means vote now this might happen but you know whatever it's as far as i mean the thing is with live streaming is you know there is an element of responsibility when you're broadcasting so if i just go yeah come on and this person is unhinged and does something really inappropriate i kind of am responsible for that so from that point of view it's perhaps not so useful but in terms of in, you know but for instance you know while we're talking now i've done a few interviews with people where this would be me interviewing you and there'd be another bit where you pick up your phone and show us around your studio you know we can see all of the what's going on and and i can do that without having to travel f to where you mm. are so there are numerous you know as technology you know and, and we're still pushing that but that's more of a video thing i think i th I, I i'm sure it's going to be feasible for things to be more interactive and for stuff to happen and, you know you see people doing live gigs where they'll they'll interact with the audience you know some kind of uh curated social stream or whatever and that's fine and I think that helps. But from, from where you are now and with your experience and also as someone who I think got more back into actually performing. Uh, a little bit recently, um, yeah, in the recent years. Is, so. is there anything um, where you would say, ah, why why hasn't every, anyone uh, done this and that? I mean, is there anything essential? What, in terms of performance? performance mm, performance or, tools or um instruments anything that would help i i don't think you can have things that would solve all the problems i think you have to have lots of little specialized things that you know you find what it's up to the person you know it's like in your studio you might have it set up a certain way go actually what would be really useful for me is that it's not going to be the same for everybody and then somebody will make what you need or you'll figure out how to do it and i think that's part of why music technology is a thing you know because music technology and musical instruments are different you know if you are just a guitarist or you're just you play the piano or you're a harpist or something you're probably more focused on your technique than anything else you're not thinking you know what if i had a piece of electronics that would change this that and the other it it, it enables us to sort of invent in a very small way and solve problems and come up with innovative ways of connecting all of this stuff together i mean obviously we're greatly helped by the standards that are provided but ultimately the fun of it is figuring out your way of doing it having said that you know there are i'm sure there are a number of things i mean I, i've always wondered for a long time why midi controllers don't have lfos in software that lf you know and and there is i can't remember the name of the software there's somebody who's done that where they can modulate cc's uh it's a plugin isn't it it's at cc's and uh system x as well sysx so you can you can uh uh tweak parameters on older synths as well you know brilliant just like yeah that's a good idea i don't know i mean i do occasionally consult you know people ask me they're making a synth i'll go up and see them and you know spend half a day talking to the developers and having a look at a prototype and maybe making some suggestions or not or whatever. I enjoy that. Uh, and I'm flattered to be asked. Uh, and I like to think that, you know, I, obviously I have a lot of experience in, uh, in synthesizers, but that, not necessarily, I'm not a great synthesis, but I see a lot of them. So, you know, I know perhaps there are certain ways that you could maybe make a, a, a complex, uh, set of options work in a simpler way you know so it's that sort of stuff making things usable i think is the key if it's, it, it may be the most amazing thing you've ever seen in your life but if you can't use it it's kind of it, it's irrelevant really isn't it, it is.
I think that's also maybe a good good final word <laughs> for 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 uh, uh, for the future of music technology um as we know it so far. <laughs> yeah, oh, no I think that's fair <laughs> enough and and I think I think yeah, that's what I would think, you know, it's got to be usable otherwise. But again, you know, it goes back to how challenged do we want to be with something new? <laughs> Yeah, I think you can't have that without getting uncomfortable. Really. Yeah, maybe so. All right, Nick. Well, thank you very much for uh, taking your time talking to me. Oh, you're welcome. I hope you can get a 10-minute section of that that makes sense. <laughs> 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 uh.